we'll move on to our next uh, speaker, uh, Professor Nicholas Pepos from the University of Texas at Austin is going to give us a presentation on innovation and invention in the pharmaceutical and biomedical industry, how to improve the treatment and quality of life of our patients. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Paul Sandberg, for this wonderful invitation, and thank you all for coming here today. All of us are here because we are inventors. Being inventor means that we care for people. We care for society, we care for countries, we care for the poor. Being a biomedical engineer or a pharmaceutical engineer, a pharmaceutical scientist has an additional characteristic. We care for poor people who suffer from diseases. And we try to come up with better solutions. And today I want to share that with you. I want to share it with a very personal introduction. All of us have a day that we remember in the past that made us become what we became. For me, that was the day. December of 1967, I was in Greece. I was listening to the radio. There was no television at home. And I heard that Christian Barnard did the first heart transplant. I was mesmerized. How could he do it? I was an engineer, a chemical engineer, second year. How could he do it? Obviously, he had machinery. Obviously, he had engines, things that were keeping the patient alive. And I started reading and working. And it was pioneers like Christian Barnard and later De Becky that really shook our generation and made us get into the field. It was pioneers like Wilhelm Kolf, who started in 1941 in Nazi-occupied Netherlands, creating the very, very primitive artificial kidney that was based on casing that he was taking from sausages. And that casing was becoming the first artificial membrane, kidney membrane, and from which he was able first to keep a call for life for a period of time and so on. A wonderful man. I met him before he passed away. Actually, I met him quite a few times, but towards the end of his life, he was really magnificent. Ladies and gentlemen, 50 years ago, I don't know, for some of you and for me, 50 years ago is not really a long time ago. <laughs> I remember very well what was happening 50 years ago. For crying out loud, it was the period of LBJ. That was past JFK. Obviously, I was already an adult. And 50 years ago, there was very limited use of the artificial kidney. There was very limited, there was no use of soft contact lenses. I don't think Bausch and Lamb had come out with the first con uh, for contact lenses. Uh, they had still the hard lenses, the polymethyl methacrylate hard lenses. Patients were dying from blockage of their arteries. And you know, the respiratory distress syndrome that many of you know, the hyaline membrane disease, as we were calling it at that time, was prevalent in neonatals. That's how Patrick Kennedy passed, died. The third or fourth day after he was born, the third child of JFK. Perhaps some of you remember that. The world has changed. Biomedicine, pharmaceutical sciences, healthcare have changed. And now we are in the most exciting period where all of us are trying to solve important play, uh, problems that affect our patients. Advanced biomaterial systems, formation and fabrication of biomolecular systems, ability to modify molecular uh, biological molecules, come up with hybrid structures and so on. Intracellular de delivery and gene therapy. You heard Professor DeMarchi talking about one extremely important application in insulin, insulin delivery, and how much that has really changed our world and the world our people who suffer from diabetes uh, can survive. I wonder if someday we're going to have the ability to diagnose, recognize, and treat a disease at the same time, and the patient will know very little about it. Or perhaps every so often there will be a correction. Maybe 50 years from now, 30 years from now, maybe 10 years from now. This is an area of triumph of bioengineering, of nanotechnology, but also of something else that I hope will be mentioned today, convergence. We all work together to solve these important problems. There are no barriers anymore. I know I'm talking to presidents of universities. Joe De Simone, Susan Hackfield, and I and a few others have really pushed, and Phil Sharp, of course, have pushed for the idea of convergence. There's a very nice book by the National Academy now that I highly recommend you read. In it, basically, we bring this multidisciplinarity. We don't call it that way. We call it convergence, where all of us converge in large groups to solve very important problems. 
look at some of the problems we are facing right now as nations around the world. Do you realize this is from WHO? By the year 2025, the areas that are in darker red or, or, or orange or brown are areas where there is going to be the beginning of an epidemic of diabetes mellitus. And this is something we could not have predicted. Now, these are the predictions of 2006. Maybe the data are changing, but it is characteristic of what's happening in one disease. And the same thing happens with treatment of cancer, with HIV, with neurological diseases, with autoimmune diseases. And I know why I'm talking about it. I'm a patient, or I was a patient myself. 23 years ago, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And I know that those of you who are in the audience and know the disease say, why is he still standing right now? I was misdiagnosed for multiple sclerosis for 12 years. And for 12 years, I was taking, I was forced to take interferon beta from a wonderful company that I still love and adore, Biogen. It was the Avonex product, but it made me change my life and it made me address very important questions that I wouldn't have addressed hadn't I been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, misdiagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So the future systems I see are systems that are nanoscale in structure. At the same time, they are systems that somehow have an intelligence, an ability to recognize that something is happening in the surrounding environment. Surrounding environment. And the word intelligence for me is not a way for NIH to give us the money or NSF. NSF to give us one graduate student. NIH to give us the money. It is a way for us to address really that there has to be an ability to interact with the surrounding environment. Be that pH change, temperature change, analyte change, thermodynamic compatibility change. So you see why a chemical engineer got into that field 43 years ago, 44 years ago. And the idea, of course, is to come up with this new type of structures. I want to show you two or three vignettes. I want to spend most of my remaining time of nine or 10 minutes talking about the transmucosal delivery of proteins. And uh, I want to show you a little bit of the academic aspect of it, really coming up with new types of systems that could perhaps, based on therapeutic agents, could be delivered to the body, not by injection, but by other methods, transmucosal methods and so on. And you know very well that such systems will be extremely difficult because the bioavailability is going to be extremely low. We've been working over the years, not only us, several others, We've been working on a variety of oral protein delivery systems, and this is really where the innovation and the invention comes in, and to some extent, the commercialization. This is one of the earliest systems. This is the earliest uh, publication after the first patents had been filed. It's a pH-responsive complexation hydrogel-based system that can come in the form of nanoparticles. It has tethers of polyethylene glycol, and those tethers, as you will see in the lower point, when they arrive in the upper small intestine, they extend because you have a hydrogen bonding that is broken, and those chains have a tendency to start penetrating by an interpenetration, interdigitation mechanism into the mucosa and stay there for a period of time, enough to allow the delivery of the protein into that site. There's an additional characteristic of those systems, but at the same time, there is protection from the proteolytic activity of some of the enzymes that we find in the upper small intestine. To make the long story short, I show you some of the earliest data showing the glucose, serum glucose uh, uh, in, uh, in an animal, and this happens to be Wister rats, happen to be pancreatized Wister rats, and you can see really a significant reduction of the glucose. Uh, don't be deceived when you see data like these from academics. They select the best data always and they try to impress you. Uh, one of the questions those of you who are pharmaceutical scientists will ask is what about insulin? And you can see that on the left side, indeed, the insulin has gone into the blood. And within a few minutes after the introduction of this particular microparticle containing device, the system is able to release really and lower the concentration of uh, glucose in the system. This was the beginning of a very large number of studies that have led to a number of patents and to an assignment to a particular company for possible commercialization sometime in the future of this system. Another system is binding insulin with transferrin. We know that transferrin is a carrier that could be used to do endocytosis and transfer across the tissue. So this is an artist's or a scientist's rendition 
of how the transferring with the protein together form a complex. The complex has a much larger molecular weight, but it has a better ability to be absorbed by the system, by the, by, by the, by the, by the intestinal wall. Uh, the system is a conjugate. It retains the activity. It's taken orally. It goes in the stomach. There is some little bit of release, but the conjugate is not diffusing out because it's a big conjugate and so on. It goes in the upper small intestine where we have the endocytotic transport across and the transfer to the other side and eventually the breakers of the system into the actual protein and the transferrin. This is the new technology and from that technology there has been now a series of platforms that I would like to very briefly mention. One of them is in hemophilia. And I mentioned just the leading scientist in this particular area for each area of my group. Uh, hemophilia, the ability to treat hemophilia using uh, hemophilia, hemophilia B uh, by uh, being able to orally deliver uh, factor nine. And these are some very early studies, but very promising studies. In the middle, the idea of osteoporotic treatment of postmenopausal women using calcitonin. What's wrong with calcitonin? It has a very high isoelectric point. It has a very low solubility at, high, uh, uh, at the conditions of our body, so it's very difficult to really absorb. And we believe with Michael that we have found a solution. The other one is growth hormone-related diseases, uh, where we are working with another group of students headed by Stephanie Steichen basically to try to find conditions under which the growth hormone can be delivered again orally. This is what led to a lot of my work. In 1992, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. I, I started taking interferon beta once a week uh, intramuscularly. Please don't tell me that patients like the present injection methods. Intramuscular means here, there, there and there, and you form scar tissues. You do it once a week, after three weeks, it hurts. I could never do an injection myself. My wife was doing it to me. No matter what you say, on an apple or an orange, you can do an injection, intramuscular <laughs> injection, or intrafrutal injection, but not on myself. Lots of other side effects, terrible side effects and so on. We started working on oral delivery, not with Biogen, but with a company called Tori, in, Japan's, and the, in Japan, and these are some of the studies, and there are many more studies, really, I could show you. Look at the very light right curve. Even if you don't know much about interferon beta, you can appreciate that it has actually been delivered and it is active in the animal. And this is the type of work that really makes me believe that we should continue work, doing work like that. We've been doing a lot of work recently on siRNA, basically for uh, hepatitis, for, excuse me, for, um, uh, ulcerate colitis, and for other types of diseases, perhaps for Crohn's disease. The reason that I had been misdiagnosed with multiple sclerosis is because I suffer from celiac. Celiac is an autoimmune disease. It has the same effect on the myelin, believe it or not. There are now documented studies. So I'm not, I don't eat, uh, of course, anything that has bread in it and so on. And it turns out that it is my next major campaign to solve problems. Uh, I don't really have time. I want to say one minute about Lynch Sharp's work. The same platform is used now for oral delivery of vaccines in a very, very powerful new technology in which we use a two-component system with internal polyhydride nanoparticles and an external uh, coating that really allows us to deliver the vaccine when we need it and where we need it. There is a lot of excitement in the laboratory, but as I am coming towards the end, I want to say all this excitement comes because all the students who work in my laboratory and the postdocs, they come to work because they want to help people. Ladies and gentlemen, you cannot imagine how great it is to develop, as we did, the first uh, endothalmial lenses for cataract, and to be there in the the company, when the first results come back, and the first patients, I know, and the first patients are released and they remove their bandages, that's 20 years ago, and there is this old lady of 72 coming to me and say, you are the inventor, my boy, you gave me my life back. 
I can see my grandchildren that I haven't seen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And that moment you realize inventors have a bigger satisfaction than the patents, the money, the publications, the awards, the academies, and the invention is for helping patients. So as I close this somewhat preaching story, I want to say I believe that someday we will have advanced intelligence systems to recognize different diseases. And I want to thank NIH and NSF, but also the Gates Foundation and a few other organizations for having supported us all these years. Thank you very much.